Welcome to Cut Daisies and Unicorns, and here we are, we're back for Season 7, Episode 9, everybody, Episode 9 is what we're on, 79. Yep, that's the number today. That is number, the number. it's a magic 70, number, I guess. 79. Is there anything special about 9? I don't ever, I don't remember anybody thinking like, ooh, nine's my favorite number. Well, have you ever heard of anybody with like a nine as their favorite number? I personally like nine. Yeah, yeah, because it takes three sets of three. It's um, it's a Celtic trinity, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I don't know what the Franciscans would see about that, but yeah. uh, I think it's a special number because it's compounded um, by three threes. Yeah, yeah. So it's a triune Trinitarian number, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> a triune Trinitarian. It's three cubed. Yes, three cubed. Apparently it's revered in Hinduism, considered a completed, a complete, perfected, and divine number because it represents the end of a cycle in the decimal system which originated from the Indian subcontinent. As early as 3000 BC. All right. Well, there we go. But what we've been using is the mystical numbers. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so not the number nine is the number of magic. I don't even know where that comes from. There's no explanation. Nine is a sacred number. Nine is the number of completion and fulfillment. There's, there's lots of numbers, though, that say then completion and fulfillment, so... Yeah, it's true. Number nine is also lucky in China. Didn't we have another number that was lucky in China? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Nine in... Nine digits in numerology. The Curse of Scotland. Hmm, this one looks might be interesting. The Nine of Diamonds is called the Curse of Scotland. Many different stories are told about this card. The most common is the Sir John Dorimple, the Earl of Stair, used this card to authorize the Glencoe Massacre in 1692. He refused to tolerate that the MacDonald clan had delivered the Oath of Allegiance to King William II after the deadline. In this massacre, 38 McDonald's were murdered by soldiers. The soldiers had been staying with them as guests and enjoying the hospitality of the McDonald's. And so they were killed by high cholesterol from <laughs> eating too many french fries? <laughs> Those McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet you their ice cream's always broken. <laughs> oh my gosh, right? Well, uh, lucky Chinese numbers, 8, 2, 6, and 9 are the favorite lucky numbers of most Chinese. Uh, number 2 is double and harmony. Number 6 is smooth and good luck. Number 8 is wealth and success. And number 9 is longevity, eternality. Hmm. Um, the other thing to note is the combinations of the above numbers are lucky numbers too. So whether you combine them. Um, but yeah, so to ask your question about, hold it, we've had other lucky numbers that are Chinese. Yeah. Which does that mean that numbers have ethnicity? <laughs> <laughs> we could, we could assign it. Sure. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean like if eight, two, six, and nine are mm. Chinese lucky, lucky Chinese numbers. Right. Well, does that make the numbers Chinese? Hmm. I don't know. Going back to the Christian realm, they got the uh, <laughs> the ninth hour is the hour of prayer. Uh, yeah, Aum. Jesus died during the ninth hour, right? Hanging on the cross. Aum. Um, that's pretty much the the extent of the. I mean, apparently there's like a nine nine consecutive days of prayer. And I'm like, I don't, yeah, that's apparently a Catholicism. It's called Novena. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I 
The name Novena comes from the Latin word Novenus, meaning nine each. So, consecutive prayers for nine days, Novena. Wow. Yeah. Single digit numbers are the building blocks in numerology. Hmm. Numerology, numbers, 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 numbers. Sonnet number nine by William Shakespeare. I don't know what the sonnet is. There's a nine pointed star apparently in Baha'i. Symbol of their faith. So. This is interesting, though, um, that the number nine represents completion, yeah, but not finality. Hmm. Uh, think of it more in a cyclical sense. It's about the ending of one cycle and potential it creates for another cycle to begin, which actually shows up in our current culture as we celebrate birthdays. Because when people turn, yeah. the lucky 2-0... I'm trying to use the Chinese lucky numbers, six zero, you know, nine zero, you know. I mean, actually, the celebration of turning to that next decade is a celebration of a, a new beginning cycle, because you've just finished the most recent decade cycle. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I mean, there's nothing evil in this, you know. It, it's it's. Really casual. I would call it casual observation. Yeah. That is interesting. Yeah. Number nine is um, humerita or humanitarian. Steve's having trouble reading today. Humanitarian. Mm. There at there heart. There you go. You got it out. It is compassionate, kind, and intent on putting its efforts towards creating the greatest good. <laughs> The, num the, the nine in numer numerology has gone through its fair share of hardship and is wiser, stronger, and more aware as a result. These firsthand experiences make it especially understanding of others who are struggling and willing to provide valuable support. Actually, um, nine is, shows up um, in German as no. Nine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but the number nine, um, they, they look at as a link going 8, 9, 10. So the motion and movement from what uh, the beauty that's found in the infiniteness of 8, um, because turned on its side, it is the infinity signal. We were just talking about that. Yep. Um, but then leading on to the number 10, which is 10 out of 10 stars. It's really interesting. Yeah. Pregnancy in humans lasts for nine months. So. Oh, that's true. And it goes back to your threes, right? So you get split up into three trimesters. Mm hmm. So maybe that's also a completion issue, right? So, you know. <laughs> You complete the gestation process, and now you have a baby. <laughs> Babies change a lot. <laughs> they change the household. Oh, wow. So we've talked in previous um, episodes. I, I believe number four was yeah. the last time we, we brought up the Enneagram. Oh, yeah. But Enneagram 9... Mm -hmm. Is you. Well, yeah. <laughs> it, it's it's So anyway, I, I googled Enneagram 9, and there's, you know, plenty of, you know, just over half, half a million. No. Half a billion results in 52 seconds. But type 9 under stress. Indecisive, passive-aggressive, and forgetful. <laughs> 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 so the reason why I have to write everything down uh -huh. is I'm just uh, under stress. <laughs> All the time. Overstressed. Um, yeah. And indecision. Oh, my gosh. I'm the worst. 
when it comes to making well especially when you like start picking places that you need to eat <laughs> yeah I'm, and i think for me the indecision on that a lot of times is not that the like i i, I can go anywhere <laughs> but what i do know is that if my family is eating with me that's where the complication comes in because they won't eat anything. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, and so that's where, like, where do you want to eat? Well, I'm going to leave it up to you because I can eat anywhere. <laughs> ha- have you found a menu in your existence mm-hmm. that you couldn't find something that you would be satisfied with? I I don't think so. I I'm mean, just reinforcing your point. Yeah, meaning that you know when it when. Hey, and you know what? We've talked about, um, you know, when when children are growing up and their taste buds haven't been burned out by coffee, nicotine, or whiskey, um, or scotch. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, you know, I mean, we we talked about you know food sensitivities, and we've talked about you know these kinds of things. But for people who are built in a way that they do have, whether it's food sensitivities or in their decision process that they're like, I know I don't like. My daughter, Michaela, actually is a a person who texture in food really affect her. Yeah. She's like, like if I say cottage cheese. Now, I don't buy cottage cheese. I grew up with cottage cheese. I think it was Mm. one of my dad's favorite... um, Lactose um, accelerated foods, <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, and uh, but I mean, yeah. So I mean, I grew up eating fruit in cottage cheese. I grew up with yeah. uh, salt and pepper cottage cheese. I think right now, just talking about cottage cheese, I you know how I eat it right now: some salt and pepper and some hot sauce. Hmm. Could you imagine, man, some habanero green chili? Hot sauce on cottage, but again, it's a texture. Yeah. Who mixes? Because I'm also not a fan of cottage cheese. <laughs> right. Um, I did make it with um, cottage cheese and eggs, and then you throw whatever you want in there, like bacon, cheese, other vegetables. Um, well, you blend together the cottage cheese and the eggs, like in a blender. Are the eggs cooked? No. Because then you cook them after it. Like you can cook it in a souffle-ish thing huh. so it's fluffier. So like the the cottage cheese makes it a fluffier. Wow. Edge. Yeah, didn't know. Yeah. But, but at that point, you're losing the curd. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to blend it, you might just as well get small curd. And small curd, That's large true. curd cottage cheese. I mean, like, wow. It's Yeah. And I don't even know... The di- like when you're going through the process of going for I mean because you're 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 taking all of that's from milk, right? So you're taking milk, you're bringing it in, and you're saying, "Hey, look at all these options we can we can do with milk. We can make cheese, we can make cottage cheese, we can make sour cream, we can make I mean so there all of these different options for." <laughs> For milk, and you're like, and then then you get small curd and big curds, and then you get cheese curds. I mean, like all of these things. Like, how and then you, if you're the state of Wisconsin, right. you can have your state cheese, which is cheese curds. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. I mean, and cheese curds are good. <laughs> I I enjoy cheese curds. <laughs> yeah. Especially when they're fresh and they get squeaky. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Fre- right. um, I I think when it comes to most food, yeah. I'm a fan of fresh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like if I if I have the preference, yeah, I would choose fresh food. Yeah. Um for sure. <laughs> so Aldi tip. Yeah. Um Amy and I have really been jamming out on the Asian egg rolls. Hmm. Um and they're super good. 400 degrees. I think it's like $3.75 for four of them. Yeah. But it's like having egg rolls from like a restaurant. 
And uh-huh. so when you sauce that up with uh, sweet chili sauce, mm-hmm. it's making my mouth salivate right now. <laughs> I like me a good frozen noodle dish all wrapped up. And then, yeah. And then, <clears throat> so Aldi tip. Oh, yeah. So I wanna, what, what, they're, they're called what? They're, the, they're like, just, like they're an just a Asian egg roll. Asian it's, egg roll. It's uh, to the Frozen left. Asian section. To the left of where all of the frozen vegetables are, they have a actual, yeah, right there. Hmm. Enneagram 9. We talked about the stressed on uh, number 9 Enneagram. I want to read this, and I, I, I'm actually going to put you on the screen. Yeah. All right. So everybody watch Phil's face as I read this to describe his friend Steve. (laughs) He's already laughing. Enneagram 9 personality traits. The most basic desire of the Enneagram type 9 is to have internal peace. Nine strive to be in harmony with themselves and the world around them. Peacekeepers defend themselves by ignoring pain or numbing their internal conflicts through food, television, (laughs) and other repetitive (laughs) patterns. (laughs) Uh. <laughs> <laughs> they att- they have tendency to avoid discomfort to the point of apathy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the basic fear of the nine is that they may lose or be separated from others. They may attempt to prevent this by remaining peaceful and avoiding conflict, potentially adapting to others' preferences rather than stating their own, which I just did a huge research on interdependency, intradependency, and codependency uh, last weekend. I mean, like a couple hours worth of study. Wow. Yeah. But it's funny because I haven't... A deep dive. Re- I haven't reviewed... <laughs> oh, I've got notes. I'm writing a book. And so... <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, so then strengths, because everybody wants to know about their strengths, right? right? right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody yeah. likes to spend time in their weaknesses. <laughs> yeah. Eh, Every personality skipping. archetype has strengths and blind spots, and these are amplified in professional settings where we often encounter a diverse group of people with vastly different backgrounds and value systems. Strengths that are typically associated with the Enneagram 9 is the ability to see multiple perspectives, remaining calm and adaptable. If you had a dollar for every time somebody walked up to you and says, why isn't he freaking out? Mm-hmm. You'd have enough to buy some donuts. Mm-hmm. Uh, supporting and reassuring those around them, right? Mediating conflict between others. Being open-minded and suspending judgment. I mean, that right there mm-hmm. is one of the major reasons when people get hacked off at me, why they don't like me or why they like... They're, mm-hmm. Like if there's an area of irritant that I become, they're like, we want you to be judgmental. <laughs> we want you to be judgmental. <laughs> I mean, please make, make a decision please here. Please be judgmental. In your indecisiveness for all-inclusiveness, please be judgmental and draw a line somewhere, right? <laughs> All right. So weaknesses that are typically associated with the Enneagram 9 personality include difficulty facing personal conflict with others. I mean, to the point of living in pain and not facing the difficulty, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Tendency to minis- minimize problems. If I had a dollar for every time I said, ah, don't worry about it, <laughs> this stuff works out, <laughs> I think people uh, in my life have wanted to shoot me over that. Um, avoiding difficult or upsetting situations, um, being passive aggressive rather than addressing conflict. And I, what I would say about that is I believe at that point I would have to lean in on my life experience. There are times when I can't afford to be passive and just have to be direct um, and get pointed. So, like, there's there's that part where that's why I would say I'm a nine wing one is because the wing one doesn't have a problem being direct in those things. Yeah. Uh, growth opportunities. Uh, Which rec- I think that's the reason why I'm a one with a nine wing. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. There's a lot of that. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if I wanted to grow more, recognizing that conflict is necessary and a beneficial part of life. See, there's that growth. Pa- oh, you know, just because this is the number doesn't mean that this these are all the things. Engaging in physical a- activity to connect with their body. What do I, like, I don't run. 
Yeah. But, but if psychologically, if I was running anywhere, it would be away from physical activity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, running away from physical activity. This one I love. Facing and working through their negative emotions. Which, I mean, there's times when I, like, I just claim the Bruce Banner quote. And that is, how do you, you know... How do you keep from becoming the Hulk? And he's like, I just stay angry all the time, mm -hmm. you know? And so, yeah. But yeah. Um, the type nine, uh, Enneagram type nine is known as the peacemaker. And yeah, so that is the fodder that is um, fuel for the book that I'm writing. And I'm not going to tell the title out on the podcast. Yeah. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I, I've got a got a good leg up, a good start, and um, it'll be interesting. I'm actually prioritizing as we're swinging through. We were moving into the contemplation time of the year, mm -hmm. you know. As the, I mean, here sunsets at four twenty six. That's crazy. Yeah, and so, um, but excuse me, uh, working towards. Yeah, I'd, I'd really like to have a rough draft done by the time spring hits. Wow. I mean, with, and, and all, all that I'm doing, I'm, I'm not laying anything else down, which when we've talked about removal and replacement, yeah, I'm not laying anything else down. I'm just becoming more acutely aware of time management, hmm. where I would have a, a tendency to saunter yeah. a bit through life. Because there's so much to be enjoyed. <laughs> there can't be. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, just just time management. It's like um, reworking my morning schedule to take. T I, I I'm not always really good about like being motivated in the morning. Yeah. Um, but quite frankly, I'm I'm just more tired at night. And so I'm going to have like time management. You got to be able to say, all right, because if I only take an hour every day, by the end of the week, I'll have five hours in mm -hmm. incremental steps yeah. towards accomplishment. So we should see the uh, first draft of a book in the spring. That's what I'm saying. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And since I've already started working on it, it's not an aspirational goal. Right. It's I mean, not just a concept. It's a... No, no. I, you know what? I think I'm just motivated by it. Yeah. Um, it may lead into um, some opportunities to maybe consult. Um, but the cool thing about that is not every person who wants you to do something do you have to do that for, you know, it's true. So you can pick and choose, but I'm not really <clears throat> the, the more it's more about, uh, I, I, I think it's a good summation of life. The life's work culmination, mm -hmm. um, in yeah. Conflict management and resolution. So, um, you might want to put you up there too, just, uh, Oh, now that we're, we've, we're still looking, we, we've gone. We're still looking at Phil's face. I just noticed it. I'm like, oh, look, look at I'm still up there. Yeah, like staring over here. Yeah, uh huh. So yeah, I like the, I like the number nine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. So there is some like of the number nine. I just had never heard of people like, oh, I'm like, my favorite number is nine. I hadn't always heard that before of people who were. Looking at numbers. Yeah. So, but we've learned something about the number nine today. And uh, Steve likes the number nine. I do. <laughs> I, you know, and, 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 and like to get there, you don't get to start with liking the number nine just as the nine. Yeah. I'm totally process. Hmm. Three sets of threes. Yeah. The triune trinity. 
The triune trinity. <laughs> yep, yep, that's it. The trifecta of triune trinity. <laughs> three, three T's. <laughs> And even though the so the, many T's. <clears throat> the word three starts with a T, it yeah. sounds like it starts with a with a th. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank God for the English language. Mm -hmm. All right, what do you got for me today, Phil? Push my button. Yeah, I was just looking that uh, Google is celebrating Myrtle Gonzalez. She starred in seventy. Eight silent era motion pictures. Wow. I don't even know what that has to do with anything. <laughs> but I did go to, I was just going to Google and I was like, what is this little background here? But she was a silent picture film actress. So huh. silent films. Have you ever watched silent films? It's not my, it's not my jam. Yeah. It's not my lady jam. Mm hmm. <laughs> so we, uh, when we first got to Chicago, we would do this um, silent movie night, and uh, the they would play the organ behind it, like the, a lot of the silent films have the where the um, almost like the music behind it is the thing that drives it. Like you you take out the the music, or you're taking out the sound, and you know like it's not very it's not as entertaining. And so if you put a live organ um, behind the silent films, it actually, you know, helps to be able to, you know, kind of see a lot of the motion of it. Huh. So it is interesting, you know, to, to kind of experience it that way. Um, I was also not always, I mean, it wouldn't have been my jam either. And I wouldn't say it's even still my jam, but it was just an interesting I mean, we did it a couple of years in a row, so. Uh huh. And I was like, huh, silent films, and eh, not necessarily. I mean, you get like Charlie Chaplin would be the uh, probably the most famous of the silent actors. Yeah. 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 And I think Laurel and Hardy were um, post, like when they were yeah. able to put sound. I I don't think Laurel and Hardy were silent actors. That's a good question. They were a comedy duo. Years they were active between 1927 and 1955. So I am trying to remember um, if uh, when the silent pictures... Um, I think it was during that time. So I wonder if Laurel and Hardy had maybe got their start in in some silent films. But style of comedy, catchphrases, films, sound films. Yeah. So if there's a whole section on sound films, I'm assuming that it's. 1929, the silent era of film was coming to an end. So, oh, 29, it was coming to an end. Thank you. Thank you, Wikipedia, for your vast knowledge of the silent film era. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. But what else do we have? We have uh, Thanksgiving this week. We do. Um. So there's, you know, lots of things that surround Thanksgiving. I do remember, you know, both that, you know, as as uh, as a kid, um, and even when my kids were growing up as well, that uh, there was still this, uh, uh, lots of images of like the the uh, the native person and the pilgrim, right? And they, right, yeah, yeah, you know, they came together at this table and they peacefully, you know, broke bread together and everybody was happy and everybody was glad and, and there was no sadness. Everything was all good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do you remember these? I mean, like I'm assuming that that was also probably a picture of things you went through as well. I grew up um, doing construction paper pilgrim and making uh, American Indian costumes 
and um, you know, drawing around your hand to create turkeys and color turkeys in. Yes, the turkey hand. The turkey hand. <laughs> <laughs> you even got a turkey call. Yeah, I can do both the uh, the chirp of the hen mm -hmm. and the warble mm. of the rooster. Wow. Yeah. Did what was it that like? How did you come up with like you just you heard them and then you're like I should emulate that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I I used to pastor in a church before, just as turkeys were being introduced into Iowa. Yeah. Now they're like flocks and flocks and flocks of turkeys mm. but they were just working their way up i believe from missouri wow and so uh, they instituted a turkey season and i was at a place where there were people who like to shoot things yeah and so uh turkey is um a pretty observant fowl difficult to hunt yeah. And to shoot the male turkey, you got to call them in. Oh. And so then these hunters would bring their calls and, uh, you know, birds of a feather s stick together. <laughs> yeah. See what I did there? Uh -huh. um, and talking about the hunters um, and like as they were practicing their calls. And a turkey call can be done on a flat box uh, with a little, it's kind of like a chalky thing and it's it sounds like this <laughs> yeah is what w that's, that's that's the hen what, yeah and then the response uh the warble of the rooster um or the tom really is mm -hmm. what a uh, male turkey's called yeah and tom they, dick and harry <laughs> tom i Na 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 and everybody's like, "What is he doing?" I'm clearing out my head on what retorts could go with that. Oh yeah, and so then the the Tom would respond with, which that's probably too verbal rounded. Yeah. Anyway. So then they would, this, I mean, would you say this is a mating call? Like they're looking <laughs> for a mate? Well, I'm not looking to mate. No, no, I'm turkey. just, yeah, like, but you're, you're I mean, it's, <laughs> yes, it's yeah, the yeah. mating call. Like that's yeah. how they would be drawn in, right? Well, and it's just like, um, I can't do a squealing rabbit, mm. but a squealing rabbit, again, with um, a uh, coyote. No, there's another predatory, predatory predatory dog in Iowa. Uh, anyway, with this wild dog animal, yeah. um, they would use the squealing rabbit to be able to, to call them in. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I believe that turkey season is in the spring, and so it would be preparatory work for the egg-laying hen so that she could get her eggs fertilized. Got it. A mating call. <laughs> it's a mating call. <laughs> yeah. So how many men have been destroyed by the mating call? <laughs> no. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> that was... It was a bullet going through my brains. Uh -huh. Yeah, so yeah, so you were talking about the the turkeys, um, the hand turkeys. <laughs> yeah, the, we uh, went from hand turkey to turkey. Did you calls. ever do a, like a um, you know like as as they would call them then, the pilgrims and the Indian plays? Like any of those? Like I mean, kindergarten is when I yeah. think I remembered a couple of those Shame, being shamefully put on. so. Right, I do, I do remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember my daughter. And, uh, and she was in kindergarten at, uh, when we were in St. Louis and, uh, they, they went through a play, but then they would sing like Mr. Turkey, right? This song called Mr. Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, uh, I mean, so I mean, there was, so I'm assuming at that point they're still 
I mean, because, I mean, yeah, my daughter's now, what is she, 22? Um, I think 22. <laughs> Um, but right. So the, I'm, I'm assuming that somebody at that time was also like, yeah, this feels weird, um, to be able to go through this, uh, this kind of period in time. But it was something that was just like, Hey, we've done this every year. This is what we do. Right. You know? And, and so I think that when you get towards like the, trying to get back to the story i think that there's lots of people who try to hold on to that story still yeah i mean because you know as as you've mentioned in enneagram nine you're like oh like it's peaceful like the natives the pilgrims sitting down together breaking bread like this this is this is peaceful um but i don't know we, we uh maybe want to try to glamorize or romanticize the uh the issues at hand right well i i i think you have to go back even to like what was happening um through the evolution of um people who live in the united states you know um if you deal with like the oppression of humanity uh, which obviously coming off of our conversation concerning genocide uh, was a pretty heavy topic. But, I mean, there was a, there was a time when commonly accepted practices um, had, had no guilt attached to them. And I think, you know, as more um, education has occurred and people, you know, have talked through, hey, what, what was it that really happened? I think there's the part where um you know there there's a heightened awareness of what took place now i mean i don't know that it wasn't a time of celebration i mean like i haven't done well admittedly we don't do the research <laughs> so yeah you know i mean as far as I, it would be easier for me just to say that the Thanksgiving meal is a celebration of the completion of the last growing period mm -hmm. than a cel celebratory of let's give thanks for landing on this continent and taking it from its indige indigenous people. Yeah. Because I'm assuming, I mean, the... Uh, I think this year the um when you're looking at the like the celebrations of of things <laughs> is that um you know you get like the the native celebrations that are kind of surrounded as well yeah you, know, you get and so then when you're looking at at uh at the Native American celebrations or the uh the recognition of kind of the history of, of the natives, you know, here in America, um, that some of these things are going to, are bound to kind of come up and like, we need to do something in order to be able to recognize it and to see it. Now, some people it's like, Oh, you're trying to rewrite history. <laughs> no, no. Like it's not a rewriting of history because we already tried that. Like we did that. <laughs> We rewrote history in order to make Thanksgiving a day of peace when chances are it wasn't a day of peace. Yeah. You know, so I think a lot of, um, you know, there are native groups that, you know, look at like un-Thanksgiving, <laughs> you know, because it was a day that whether it was a start of the, you know, the, um, the pilgrims making their way they're finding land and they're like, oh, like, look, this is, you know, land that's uninhabited. Nope. Like it was, it was habited. Right. <laughs> there were inhabitants. Yeah. And uh, we're like, oh, but we kind of like this land. Yep. And so did the people who were living there. Right. So when we're looking, I mean, and there were promises made, you know, they, they said, hey, let's try to live at peace. But I think that was like the long chain of like un you know promises that were broken too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean 
I mean, in a lot of the, the natives, I mean, they, um, some of them moved peacefully. You know, some of the groups were like, yeah, we don't want to fight you. We don't want war. We'll go. Some of them, some of them, some of like the warrior tribes ended up saying, no, we're not going to put up with this. And they fought back. Yeah. And then, then we, you know, kind of paint them in history as like these savages. Right. And they're like, so natives are savages, you know, or, you know, like, and it would be the same thing. I mean, America fighting back against, you know, the tyranny of, you know, what they were under as well. We're like, they're, they're celebrated. They were revolutionaries. They were, you know, people not wanting to be, you know, under the thumb of, of the king or queen. And so, like, somehow, like, we, we've turned our people into heroes, and yet we've taken a look at, you know, tribes who were trying to push back and say, ah, oh, these were savages. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of things that, are, that surround this. And I was telling you, I um, came across the term today listening to a news story about... Um, you know, not just the, the term unthanksgiving, but they actually call it thanks taking. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, you know, and it is, you know, a, kind of a, a term that's, uh, kind of goes back to, um, you know, the colonization of America and that we took land, you know, we took what we wanted and we, you know, ended up, um, a lot of, a lot of native people were uh, killed because of disease, killed because of, you know, the wanting of land. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it's kind of like this a little bit backhanded, like kind of saying thanks taking. Like, hey, so you're, you're going to celebrate the day or the time that you decided to take everything from us. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think about when you hear that word thanks taking? instead of thanksgiving well <clears throat> i mean we're we're entering into a conversation where like people who are listening are like why do you guys have to be such a downer this is a holiday <laughs> right. you know and um and i i think when i walked in the door i asked the question is there a difference between observation mm -hmm. of a holiday and the celebration of a holiday yeah. Um, like in recognition of what is going on around you, does it make you complicit with the actions of others? Um, and so I, you know, to me, it's just an acknowledgement that the foundational part of this holiday um, was, to your point, what we were handed in history um, in our lives, which I don't know that the kids are doing turkey hand drawings to bring home from kindergarten or first grade. I think they still might do the the turkey thing because it's still kind of just But they don't bring in the indigenous I versus I'm not I don't think so. I mean we also don't have young kids anymore either. Right. So Right. Yeah. So yeah. if you wanna if you wanna fill us in, you know and some people get just really upset with what's the matter? Why can't we remember history the way it was mm -hmm. um, or the way we were remem remembering at the time? And, and what I would put out there is a lot of archaeology and a lot of discovery um, ha has been, you know, discovered, you know, in the, in the <clears throat> excuse me, in the last 40 years. Yeah. So there's new information. It's not like, oh, well, they just want to like, um, erase what we knew to be true. Um, there, there's new information, um, just like uh, specialty groups uh, would argue for the actual documentation of what really did happen um, concerning Jim Crow and you know other other black-eyed points of historic United States history. Yeah, um, I'm having a hard time. What where where my head was going? was the idea of if we understand what's happening to the planet right now. And, and current world population is about 8 billion people. Mm, yes, it just hit 8 billion. Yeah, yeah. 
It um, took 12 years. Yep. Yeah. To so, gain a billion people, 12 years. So. Mm-hmm. And so they're looking at 9.7 billion um It by 2030, 9.7 billion in uh, 2050, and 10.14 billion in by 2100. I mean, those are projected growth, um, but 8 billion. Well, the world population, so when the, when the Americas were discovered, mm-hmm. North and South America. They're guesstimating the probable in indigenous population of about 60 million in 1492. For comparison, Europe's population, so this isn't world population, yeah. but Europe's population at the time was 70 to 88 million spread over less than half the area. So, I mean, people came over and there's like, well, there's all this air. So there's double the area and there's less population. So, of course, this is available and here to take. Yeah. Yeah. And so that takes us into a, if you want to get into a politically correct um, uh, topic or title, uh, you know, the colonization of uh, the Americas. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Yeah, so, you know, I, I don't know. What do I think about... I I also think that, because you said takes giving, right? Thanks taking thank, instead thank, of thanks thanks ta- giving. Thanks taking, yeah. yeah. And so um, I, I think one of the things that that title does is that it, it calls out a part that we don't want to look at in the mirror, and that is that as humanity, we're consumers. And so, um, you know, how, how in, in consumption, how can we move into a place where instead of what we're absorbing and taking, whether it's from the earth or from other people or, you know, on the backs of others, you know, what does it mean to be a giver and not a taker? Yeah. And I think we always turned, you know, I mean, Thanksgiving was like giving thanks yeah 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 i mean and that's you know the the idea of having gratitude for the things that we do have and not just the things that we don't have um it always you know it it always is funny to me that we have thanksgiving followed up by black friday (laughs) right i mean and there there is the um you know that there is the conundrum of uh, how in the world you know how how have we moved as a society in such a place where before Halloween even occurs, they're putting up Christmas decorations right you know I can really appreciate that in the turn, like um in our little village, uh, the gentlemen were out hanging lights. And I, I really can get on the side of lights, not just for the Christmas season. I, Me personally, if you're going to put lights up, <laughs> this is my inactivity. Um, if you're going to put lights up, why not hang, let lights hang, you know, at least through January? Hmm. Should. Be- because it does. It gets so dark. And right. this is a dark season. So having lights around as an illustration to light shining in darkness, I think that's a beautiful picture, and I like it a lot. I, I'm i not anti-Christmas decorations. I'm not anti that people sell Christmas decorations. I am anti that when it's just barely getting through September, that Christmas decorations are coming up, and we have 12, what, September, October, November, and then into December, almost 16 weeks coming into the holiday? I'm pretty sure, yeah, I'm... <laughs> just sign me up let uh, paint me green <laughs> right i'll steal christmas <laughs> yeah i i have been uh um 
Yeah, that's that's been lobbed at me many times throughout uh, the seasons of uh, getting ready for Christmas. It's always like, yep. Yeah. I think I even have a Santa hat that might say Bah Humbug. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, like the the consumerism that surrounds it is is always hard for me. Um, like we're jumping into like, Hey, we've got this, you know, month almost that's dedicated towards gratitude and giving thanks. And then it's like, we turn it around and we're like, let's do the opposite of, yeah. What can I get? <laughs> right. What are you going to get me? Yeah, yeah. So let's, let's turn this into how much can I grab and how much can I get versus like, Oh, so I'm grateful for what we have right now. Except for all the stuff that I don't have yet. Yeah, yeah. And that comes in the next season. Yeah. I don't know. So, I mean, like, fall is fun. I mean, there's some things in fall that are fun. But when you, you, like, winter. Like being a soccer coach? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Fall is fun. But, um, like, I mean, and, and this goes back to, like, our, you know, like Debbie Downer stuff is like, but winter is a season of death. <laughs> I mean, things are dead. Well, and how beautiful for people who are listening who do have faith in a, an unseen God, mm-hmm. okay? Um, and your faith basis is built on the... If, do I say this uh, correctly? Judeo- Judeo-Christian mm-hmm. belief system. Yeah. Um. You know that there is a light in the darkness during the season of death, which is the birth of Christ. Yeah. Now, in its celebratoriness, uh, here's where we get to be a little bit transparent, Phil. In the reality, the beauty of the birth is one of the saddest moments of that belief system because this child was born to die yeah sacrificially Mm -hmm. and if death was the only thing and we stop there it would be a very depressing story but because of the resurrection then we push through death into the afterlife yeah and so there's where then um, b- the beauty of the birth uh, can gain some traction in bringing warmth and heartfeltness, joy. Um, you know, in concerning you know that system of belief. Now, I I think that you and I are both bent in a way because of the demands of the work of the church, mm-hmm. and. That, in, even in itself, is a sad commentary. That the expectations of humanity about what should be the organized church's role in this annual celebration um, and, and the work that it entails and what's gone on. So, I mean, right. you know, but again, I, that's where people have to start asking the question do we do this because it's traditional? Do we do it because it's, we've always done it this way? Do we, you know, basically it's within a church, it's pooling the expectations of the population of, of what's needed, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, for this time. Oh man. I, I think I went seven years in a row on black Friday, decorating a church, because Advent started <laughs> on the Saturday after Thanksgiving, <laughs> right? I mean, and and I mean, and it, it's not play the martyr. Oh my God! Oh poor Steve, he had to work on Black Friday. Yeah. People at Walmart have to work on Black Friday. You know, no, I mean, it's not that. It's just an acknowledgement of. And there, there were times in the first part of that decade that. Um, like it was early morning, late night, and early morning coming in and barely wrapping up the finish of the decorations to be able to start rehearsal, you know. Um, right. Me, I fought 
as a mediator for <laughs> just because the church calendar says that it's Advent doesn't mean you have to start Advent. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of what I uh, like usually. <laughs> I land on that as well. Like, hey, so like this could be a gradual process. Oh, yeah. Like, hey, throw a tree up. Sure, whatever. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to throw anything up, <laughs> I mean, a, a partially digested tree would seem to put you out on a limb. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> Bad dad jokes. Right. Um, But, you know, and, and then there's, uh, you know, I think, I think when we go back to, you know, thanks taking. Mm-hmm. And Thanksgiving, um, you know, in in the practical application from my family of origin, I mean, it really was a time for family to gather together and, um, you know, reflection on, you know, it was giving thanks, you know, um, and 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 having the attitude of gratitude. If you want to get a little uh, leadership promotional uh, verbiage in there. Throw some axioms in there. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, like, it's not, it's, it's not a reflection of that those things haven't been good um, as much as a just raised awareness of, you know, what did, what did it cost other people for us to be able to quote unquote celebrate this? Yeah. Um, or place it in observation. Yeah. I am, and, and this is the, like, how how can we, like, hold these in balance still? So, I mean, like, I think for us to say, hey, let's just scrap Thanksgiving altogether um, so that we can, you know, observe something. That, like, I don't know if we can do that. We can't take a, you know, a giant, like, 180 and go in the other direction. Like, so how can we hold balance? both and still say hey we observe that the history of things that occurred you know wasn't wasn't always the rosy picture that we tried to paint it and to be able to say hey we can celebrate and say you know that native lives um have not always gone you know uh in the way of being celebrated uh and so what can we do how can we still hold that in balance and still at the same time, you know, like, um, yes, we can give thanks today. You know, let's give thanks for the things that we do have. And we can give thanks, hey, like, I don't want to go in that direction again. I don't want to try to take from people. I want to try to be able to, you know, to be content in all situations. You know, thankful for what I have. And knowing that I'll probably still going to get some more, but it doesn't mean that I have to, like, change my entire life just to be able to get more. Yeah. You know, and I think that giving us a, a perspective on this is is good. Like, we can think about it. We can look at it and say that it wasn't good. It wasn't good on the Native lives who were here. And... uh and there's some of them who are even looking, and we, you know, have brought this up in the past, but generational trauma. Yeah. You know, and, and to be able to say that, you know, like that's, you know, like that's dumb or that's not true. Like, no, it's actual science that they've studied that generations after generations have inherited this trauma and that it affects their bodies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when then you start thinking about all of the uh, the the stereotypes, um, the things that are lobbed at native, like you know, like they have a, uh, I mean, there's a lot of of alcoholism mm-hmm. in the amongst the native people. Yeah. Now that's not stereotype, even though you can turn it into a stereotype saying all of them are alcoholics. Not true. Right. 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 But there is. That is an issue amongst the native people. Yeah. Um, even to the to the point where there are some native lands that you cannot buy alcohol on native land. Well, and I think that that then begs the question: Is that an imposition by government 
upon yeah american indians uh because you know because of the reservation uh or is that self-imposed through tribal council i don't know the answer to yeah, that i don't either yeah um i know it came out um, again in uh, one of the epi this latest episode of Yellowstone right right was like you know I mean, it was a part of the tribal land so but I, whether or not it was imposed is yeah that's a good question yeah like somebody from the government said oh native land even though yes that is your land sovereign land whatever we think that this is a good thing for you to do consider it you know yeah. and maybe they they put it into you know into uh, tradition like, yep, now we're not going to do this. Yeah, yeah. Which only leads to um, other ways of, you know, of escape. Yeah. Um, which means that, um, you know, I, I, I've been in Honduras and, you know, seen um, people who, like, the things that they would drink to be able to lose their minds, mm -hmm. um, just really hard to conceive um that those kinds of things i mean like when people are drinking rubbing alcohol right i mean and we know that that create i mean creates really it's really really hard on the body and on procreation um but you know i i, I just come back to then i personally in me start asking this question can I come to a place and confess that I am a consumer? Mm -hmm. And when I answer yes to that, then it pushes me into um, as far as what's entrusted to me, how well am I a caretaker? So kind of a stewardship thing. Mm -hmm. If this is entrusted to me, am I taking care of it? Then I move into, now, how do I move into a place of generosity? Or will I say that I'm not going to be generous? And generosity isn't about how many checks I write out. Mm -hmm. um, that, that can, um, or you can't escape looking at, are you generous with your time? Are you generous with your skill set? Are you generous, you know? Um, and then there, there's a recognition even in those things that throughout the seasons of life, the things that you can be generous with are different things. Right. You know, uh, when, when, um, when, when we can speak from when we were younger, and we were younger fathers. The whole point was to take care of the children that we were raising. Um, I don't know about you, but it didn't seem like that there was a lot left at the end of the month when, you know, and, and so it wouldn't surprise me that there's moms or dads who are listening to this and saying, wow, it's expensive to raise a child in this day and age. And you, how, how can we be generous? But I, generosity shows up uh, in, in a lot of different ways. It shows up in connectivity. It shows up in, you know, being able to spend quality time. It shows up with, you know, uh, and yeah. But we also live in a day and age where if you click on a button, Amazon can have fresh food to you in two hours. <laughs> right. You know with a click of a button, what is it, you know, where I think that back historically, gift giving was really stocking up on the necessities for life. You know, there was a family tradition where um, my grandmother gave the, I think it was the great grandchildren. Maybe it was just the grandchildren, but, um, like new new pajamas. Usually it was like by the time you got older, it was footless, um, like long john material printed or whatever pajamas, a top and a bottom. You know, mm -hmm. it, the, there's nothing beyond the practicalness of a year later you're going to be bigger. You need bigger pajamas, <laughs> right? You know, um, it, the idea of that you got a winter coat for Christmas made sense. 
because you were in the middle of winter and you probably outgrew your coat from last year. Right. You know, or pair of shoes or, I mean, you know, the practical senses where like if people need shoes now, what do they do? Amazon, Amazon. <laughs> size dot dot hit click. It's delivered. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. So am I a consumer? Right. That moves me into a point of confession. Can I confess that I am a consumer? In that awareness, how well am I taking care of the things that are entrusted to me? Am I wearing it, wearing it out, going through it? You know, am I recycling it? Am I reusing it? You know, how, how many different ways instead of something just being tossed out or tossed to the curb? Um, mm-hmm. And then from stewardship of what's entrusted, then moving into, does this lead me to a place of that because of this, that I can be generous, whether it's with my time, uh, with my skill set, uh, with my person in being present, um, you know, and how does that all fit together? Yeah. And I think that's a, a big portion of, of what we should be trying to consider. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, is being able to look at everything that we do and, and, and like, how can we not as citizens of the United States know that we're like, we are consumers, like we're a consumer culture. Yeah. I mean, and that's just what we are. Like if we're to be able to say yes, I mean, and going back to your kind of confession part is like, we live in this, like every person who lives here has been affected by this. Like, let's just say it, this is what it is, but let's try to be able to say, instead of making it what it was, like, let's try to shape and form something new, you know, coming from that place of what we say, confession, right? We're, we're going to change this because this has been ugly. Yeah. And I think that there's some, you know, maybe some different minded people. I mean, they're looking at trying to, I mean, so there's been Black Friday specials now for multiple days or weeks. You know, so maybe that's like, hey, let's change this, you know, narrative a little bit. I mean, it also could be that we're looking to create consumers, not just on a Black Friday. Right. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I guess trying to take a, a look at this. I mean, there's some people who are like, we're just not going to be open on Thanksgiving. And even like, hey, <laughs> wouldn't it be great? Let's just take Black Friday off. I mean, hey, why not? Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> that that's an aspirational goal. Yeah, is it? But I I think personally, I mean, I I just would blurt this right out. If if I had a storefront that was open with my pottery, mm-hmm. I would be open on Black Friday. Yeah, because you know. <laughs> well, because sh- shoppers are shopping. Right. I mean, and I don't, I mean, the the, the purpose of being in, you know, if, if I was going to open a shop and I would do it around, like, it's why I wouldn't open a shop in April and shut it down in July. Mm-hmm. And why would I open a shop? Why wouldn't I open a shop in November and December right. when I know that people are, purchasing you know there's gift buying and yeah yeah it's a heightened awareness you know i mean so from a business perspective and i just wanted to be able to put that out there that in the motion of this i don't know i don't know that i would get on board for an elimination of that (laughs) just but that's not that doesn't make me a consumer it makes me a capitalist Capitalist. (laughs) (laughs) that's what i (laughs) Right. 
So why would you not try to capitalize on a capitalistic system? <laughs> I, I mean, and that's where the, I think the, the businesses, the, I mean, they, they know. Like, if this is going to be a time that people are consuming, why would we not have a product to hell have them consume it, right? Buy it. We want you to buy it. We want you to be able to, you know, take, uh, you know, this advantage, <laughs> So I I hear it. I mean I I understand where that's at, but it's also like, how are we still trying to be able to question and and hold things and be mindful of the things that are happening? I mean, I'll like I, how do we do that? Yeah, I I just I th- I think it goes back into a holistic approach on how are, how are you approaching life? Yeah. And it, so then my question is, why, why can't we be grateful all year long? Does, is, this, is this a pinnacle point for reflection going backwards to ask the question, how grateful have I been? Mm-hmm. Um, that's looking backward. Then going forward, you know, what goals am I going to set? I, I, make, I really appreciate not having to wear a mask. Me too. In, in in our current society, having uh, come through the pandemic, and um, because interfacing with humans without being able to read the whole of the face is just something that I mean, after fifty some years of interfacing with humanity, y- you just get used to facial recognition of what's really going on. Yeah. When someone's having a bad day. And they're a beeper. Um, that you know, there's they're they're at the grocery store and they beep, 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 beep. You know, all all of this stuff going through. Yeah. Um. You know, but who's who's your favorite beeper? Like there, there's where I move into like it's service industry. Yeah. Um. You know. It, it it just is one of those things where you know do we frequent and i know the guy who's the assistant manager at aldi true chicago guy i've heard him chopping it up with other people who know him and he knows you know and stuff and you know i just try but to pull his name i haven't taken the time mm. to be able to put his name into my memory right Duncan, on the other hand, me and Duncan are talking weather. Duncan has a fascination with weather. Hmm. Like, he is a weather reporting station every time he sees me. <laughs> I mean, he warns me of thunderstorms that are coming on. <laughs> wow. And, and Duncan might be 19 to 21 years old or so. He walks yeah. from his apartment or his his home with his mom because i he's been there and been shopping for, and and said to other people who are his work buddies yeah. you know oh yeah just picking up some stuff for my mom you know and blah 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 like i've been around enough in observation to be able to see this but gosh duncan whenever he sees me you know or if i see duncan walking and i'm in the car i beep at him and i, I i'll wave you know i mean i have a noticeable beard i'm recognizable um you know in that and but i mean gosh i there's great joy in smiling and interacting. Now there's this new guy and I don't know his name yet, but he's this tall, lanky black guy. And this guy has charisma. Hmm. Now I always feel weird. This, this has taken a turn. I'm sorry, but (laughs) I always feel weird when black men call me boss. Uh. You know, I'm, I'm like, I'm not your boss, <laughs> right? You know, but like I, you might as well call be calling me cracker, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But uh, but I mean this this guy with charisma, yeah, he'll he'll chop he'll he, he just is bold, chop it up. He's like, hey man, he, like how talk to me about that beard, you know? And and uh, we we get on this conversation, but interaction and you know and, and stuff like that and. If you make that experience fun, then the whole monotony of beeping, it's like, you know, and, and then we got a couple guys from Haiti 
and they're chopping it up back and forth in their uh, Creole. I mean, I it just it's such a great I don't know experiment called grocery shopping. <laughs> called grocery, that's good. You know, but um, yeah, I mean, I've been around shopping there long enough. I'm I I almost might be considered a regular. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it sounds like you would be considered a regular. <laughs> well, the the thing is, and, and that's that's my point, is that smiles, brightness in the eyes, not being a dick. You know, I, I'm around plenty of other shoppers who are downright rude. Yeah. You know, and so like in, in how whenever... The lady who I know is going to be very slow bagging my groceries. You know, I don't rush her. I don't push her. I don't, I don't, I don't like grumble at her. I just say thank you. But a kind thank you? I mean, that, it's being grateful. Um, and I, I am a bit of an absent minded professor. I do not always 100% hit being affirmative and appreciative Mm -hmm. all the time and and i i I just think maybe now there's a part if you're like hey would you move in i'm not willing as as a capitalist i'm not willing to give up black friday but i would be willing to enter into being more grateful (laughs) all year long (laughs) the bigger task right the harder task. <laughs> we want a Black Friday revolution. And Steve says, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I've ever... I mean, I've gone shopping on a Black Friday, but I don't know if I've ever gone Black Friday shopping. You have not <laughs> been the opportunist to get the most specialist of deals, right. of greatest discount. Right. I mean, I've done Cyber Monday, I think they call it. That's where it's That's like, coming up. Yeah, I mean, yeah. which is after. So it, you get Black Friday, you get Small Business Saturday. Yeah. I don't. I think Sunday gets a, a day of its own because there's no, as far as Isn't I know. Isn't there like a donation something where like you can. That's on Tuesday. Okay. Giving Tuesday then follows Cyber Monday. Where the nonprofits are really big about yeah. calling on people and saying, hey, do you have any money for us? And most likely you've already received emails from nonprofits saying, hey, Giving Tuesday is coming up. I've already gotten like four emails, I think. <laughs> like Giving Tuesday, it's coming up, guys. Consider it. Yeah. Don't spend all your money on Friday, Saturday, and Monday. <laughs> Once again, the importance importance of a budget. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right. So where are we going to land today on this? Have we already landed? Well, yeah, I think we have. Okay. I mean, I feel like we have. All right. Yeah, yeah. It, it, just as far as, you know, like... What and what 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 does it mean to be mindful throughout the year of giving, um, thankfulness and being grateful and you know moving all into that? Um, what I also think that where we can land is, hey, thanks for people who are close to us putting up with us. <laughs> yeah for being the people we are it's always good in in, in our bend and in our bent <laughs> of uh what what life has turned us into um and and just know uh from the bottom of both of our hearts mm-hmm. that we're still growing we're still learning yeah you know and sometimes uh when needs are felt but not expressed we can't know what those needs are mm-hmm. and on the flip side that's where conversation, heartfelt, you know, makes changes and differences in everyone's life. Yeah. Yeah, so we're committed towards continued growth. <laughs> I mean, we've talked about it on episodes of the past. Yeah. I mean, we want to continue to learn what we don't know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so learning something new and... And then saying, how is this learning going to shape me? And hopefully you've learned about the uh, thanks taking and the giving of thanks. 
and how we can be transformed in that to not try to steal and take and consume, 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 but also like, hey, let's let's consider a different attitude. Yeah. Yeah. Once again, taking your motives and holding up a mirror and asking you to do the reflection. Right. That's all. That's it. Well, hey, we've had a great, uh, great time here in the studio. And just know that our plan is for next week, we actually might get back to a Thursday schedule, maybe. It's possible. Yeah. Yeah. We've, is this yeah. our third week or fourth week in a row on Wednesdays? I think it's the third week. I think so. Yep. Could be. Could be three. Could be four. I don't even know what's happening. <laughs> but we <laughs> Oh, come. no, because I think the fourth, uh, the one week we had was a Friday that we did. Uh, oh, yeah, there you go. Right before that. So it was yeah. like we still have it. Friday, Wednesday, Thursday. Wednesday, Wednesday. Mm-hmm. And now we'll see what next week has to hold. Yep. But we're coming at you with the finish around the corner with um, our... Season seven coming to go uh, to a close next week. It is, yeah. Season ending episode number ten. That's true. Next week. Oh. All right. So until then, hopefully, if you're uh, enjoying family time or you have some people around you, um, be present. Celebrate the time that you get, and uh, know that. You know, it's a time to cherish. It's a time to, to think and consider those that are surrounded with you. Surrounding you. I don't know. Something like that. Yeah. Hey, hold hands, give hugs. <laughs> Smooches on the cheeks are appropriate. And uh, just know that uh, we're glad for your listenership. And we look forward to the time when we can share a room together. Take care, for sure.